it's the six o'clock. It's all good. Hey, if you got your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to First Corinthians. Yeah, that's right. Come on, come on, come on. And Ben, you can turn me down just a little bit in the monitor, um, but keep it loud in the house. That's how revival hits. Come on. All right. Now I do. I do want to say this. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know who the Pursuit Church is, um, but we're in a in a series called Church Under Fire. And, um, and we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we're seeing that th this is a church in Corinth that was under fire. And now you know that, that, that there are some churches under fire in the U.S. And we understand that fire a little bit here at SRC. But our brothers over at the Pursuit Church over in Snohomish, um, they, they are in the fire right now. And they released their response and so um, they were issued a, um, uh, quite a ginormous document this last week, basically threatening them to shut down their church um, because of COVID. Otherwise, that there would be uh, charges pressed against their church from the attorney general um, uh, in Washington state. And Pastor Russell released a video uh, today um, that told the state of Washington um, <laughs> some things and what they're saying is uh if you want us come and get us you'll know where to find us we're not shutting down <laughs> and I would encourage you to uh to go and watch the video at the pursuit uh and I just want to say that I'm so stinking proud of you Russell Johnson I love you like a brother I love what your church is doing you guys stand for Jesus you stand for righteousness there's no compromise in you there's no compromise um, and what you're doing, and we're behind you, and we support you, and we're standing with you tonight. And we will pray, and we will give, and we will be behind you. You've got, you've got family in the region. And so we just, we just say thank you, Russell, um, for doing what a lot of other pastors aren't doing, and you're taking a stand. We stand with you. Let's stand tonight, symbolic of us standing with Pastor Russell Johnson and the Pursuit Church. Let's pray for them. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the Pursuit Church. That this was a God dream, a God thing that you have ordained for such a time as this. We declare the protection of God about the pursuit around all the young men and women that call that church home. We thank you for the stand of righteousness that they have taken today as a community. And Father, we pray for your protection and unprecedented provision. And Lord, I know that you're going to give the enemy a black eye for this one. They picked on the wrong church. And Father, we thank you, Lord. This is just the enemy freaking out because the kingdom of God is so at hand. There is a harvest for such a time as this. And Lord, we thank you, Lord. This is just, this isn't flesh and blood. But this is principalities and powers trying to tweak things through people that don't know better. We call you blessed tonight. We say we love you. We're praying for you. We're standing with you. In Jesus' name, everyone said... Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Guys, um, like I said before, we're in a series um, uh, uh, called Church Under Fire. And tonight we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, looking at verses 6 through 19. And I titled this thing. <laughs> Not for sale. Yes, I was a professional beatboxer before I gave my life to the Lord. But then I lost all my skills. And so anyways, I'm, I'm, still trying to get my, I'm still trying to get my skills back. But I just, if it, for, you know, I just do it. I just roll. That's how I roll. All right, good, good, good. First, all right, here we go. Now, uh, last week we looked, we began this journey in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay. And we, we studied the first six verses. Now, when you study this chapter, okay, commentators are going to say, this is a chapter about how ministers should handle finances. Yes, they are right. Okay? But the first six verses are radical. Why? Because before Paul gets to his main point, he's going to take a little bit of time to defend himself. And last week we talked about this. We talked about if there's one thing that Christians are not very good at, they're not really good at sticking up for themselves. Right? And, and we've got a lot of verses sometimes that we use. Not us, but people on Facebook. And um, just kidding. You're loved. Actually, we're not on Facebook tonight. We're on YouTube tonight. 
God in his providence just was like, Facebook ain't happening. Um, but uh, needless to say, there's a lot of things that people say. There's things that people say. I don't know if you heard some of these things. But like, like when somebody picks on you, when somebody's like, like coming after your reputation or whatever else. Well, Jesus said, you know, turn, turn the other cheek, right? Um, that when, when stuff's getting hot and heavy, uh, you shouldn't stick up for yourself. You shouldn't speak up, right? Um, because why? Because blessed are uh, the peacekeepers. No. Uh, wrong. Yes, the Bible does not say blessed are the peacekeepers. That's the United Nations. And we all know how helpful they are. The kingdom of God has not been called to be the United, the United Nations. No, no. It's, it doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers, right? Blessed are the passive, for they shall... No. Jesus never said blessed are the passive, nor did he say blessed are the passive aggressive. What he said is... Heyo, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. If you're going to make peace, then you're going to have to step into the chaos. Yeah, so you have Corinth, it's the first century, and you got some people, and they're talking trash on Apostle Paul. And so what does he do? He sticks up for himself. He speaks back, and he says, hey, rumor has it, some of you talking trash on me. And this is what you need to know. Am I unquestionably free? Absolutely. Am I an apostle? Yes, absolutely. Have I seen the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, 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 yep. And do I encounter him daily? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Okay, so then what's your proof that you're an apostle? You, silly. You are my proof. You are my living proof. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, this is what he says. He says at the very beginning, am I free? Yep. Absolutely. And then he begins talking about finances. Why? Because in this time, you guys, in the, in the first century, that if you were like a legitimate apostle, if you were recognized in the church, you received finances from the believers in that province, in that area. And so Paul's kind of, he's kind of setting this thing up, but kind of sticking up for himself a little bit. Because he's going to talk about finances and his choice to not actually receive finances from the church. But before he does that, he's going to build a case for why it's okay for ministers to receive finances from the church. And yep, 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 you guessed it. Tonight we're going to be talking about finances. Gold. Yeah, we're going to talk about finances. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about ministers and money. And you're like, who cares? I'm not a minister. Well, whoop, whoop, whoop. Yes, you are. Yep, this is, this is not the dark ages. We do not believe in the separation of clergy and laity. We believe in the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. And what does that mean? That means you're a priest. So am I. Yep, you don't have to go through Darren to get to the Father. You go through the Son. You go through Jesus. You don't need me to forgive all your sins. You don't, you don't need to give me your money so I can make something happen in heaven. No, you go directly to the Father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Paul's going to talk about um, uh, ministers, money, his, his right to receive money, how he's too legit to quit. That was last Sunday. Um. How he is still legitimate, even though he has not chosen to receive finances. And then, guys, there's some, there's, some, there's some big stuff in here for us tonight. Okay? And I want you just to declare this with me. I am not for sale. I'm not, I'm not for sale. I'm not for sale. All right, Paul, what do you guys say? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife? This is continuing from last week. Don't I have the right to receive support? And Paul's not even married. He's like, but if I were married and I had a believing wife, wouldn't we have the right to receive finances? And do the other apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or like, is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? And we do know that Paul actually worked for a living. So he didn't. He didn't get paid for ministry. He had his own little tent making company. So he'd preach during the day, and then at night, he'd be he'd be he'd have his sewing machine out, and he'd just be like, <laughs> that's. 
that's what Paul was doing. During the day, he was preaching. He was writing. He was writing letters to the churches. And then at night, he was trying to get that darn thread through the needle. <laughs> okay? He goes, don't I deserve that right? Then he continues. Verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who, check it out, plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends to a flock without getting some milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? He does not certainly speak of our sake. It is written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share in this rightful claim on you, do we even more? This is what Paul says. He says, hey, like, if I took a salary, would that be so bad? No, absolutely not. If I'm doing spiritual things and there's some sort of material gain and that I get to receive from that, wouldn't that make sense? Like, absolutely. For example, if I were a farmer and I planted a, an orchard, couldn't I have some fruit? Absolutely. If I had a vineyard and I planted grapes, couldn't I have some wine? Absolutely. But in moderation. Careful, brother. And, well, what if I had some cows? And I, and, I, and I had some cows. Then wouldn't it be okay if I just had a, a little bit of the milk and a little bit of the cheese? Yes. Absolutely. And isn't it true? Isn't it written? That even the oxen, they, they're threshing on the wheat. And even they get to take their big fat ox head and eat a little bit of the grain? Yes. Absolutely. So would it be so bad if I were to receive a little bit of material reward for what I'm doing? No, that wouldn't be so bad. That would be my right. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> he says, nevertheless, I haven't made use of this right. This is my right, and yet I'm not going to take advantage of this right. Yep. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of Christ. So he says, hey, I got rights. What's more important than my rights? Young American, listen to me right now. I got rights. Okay, good. Chill out. Don't, don't, take, don't take my guns. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right, awesome. I got rights. What's more important than your rights? The gospel. The integrity of your testimony. Yeah. Verse 13. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But, okay, I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. This is what he's saying. Hey, listen. I know this is a killer offering message right now. I know I could pass the golden bowls and there would be a lot of money that would come in this offering. But that's not the point of me saying these things. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For another thing that Christians are allowed to do, by the way, is brag. Paul does it. I mean, he just admitted it right there. Why would I let you <laughs> allow me of the opportunity to brag. Paul, man, so legit, so ahead of his time. Man, oh my goodness. Like, even today, the dude would get, you know, rejected by some of the crazy stuff that he said. Sometimes I could be like, look, I didn't say it, Paul said it, all right? So don't get mad at me, okay? All right, verse 16. For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with stewardship. Everyone say reward. Everybody say stewardship. We're talking tonight about stewardship. We're talking about rewards. And where are they going to be? You know, are they earthly rewards? Are they heavenly rewards? Does it matter? I don't know. Well, we're going to look at all this stuff. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Verse 19. Now, do you remember last week that Paul began this text by saying, hey, yo, 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 yo. You guys know how I'm free? Yep, yep, yep. Look, he repeats himself again. Check it out. Verse 19. It's like he's starting to brag or something, right? This is what he says. For though, by the way, I'm free from all. Isn't that awesome? Two bookends. In the beginning, guys, you know how I'm free. That's true. 
I'm going to defend my freedom here. And then he ends this, like, this thought right here again by reminding everyone, hey, I'm free from all. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, I have the right to be compensated for ministry. Why? Because I'm a legitimate apostle. He says, being paid as a minister, um, uh, that is not my blue check mark. Okay? He says, I deserve to be paid, but I don't want your money. Why? Because if I received your money, it could in fact affect the integrity of my message. And then he says, he begins and ends, I'm free. I'm even free from you. You can't control me. Why? I'm not on your payroll. <laughs> Paul's found a way to be financially independent. He has found a way that he can present his message. He's found a way that he doesn't have to tap dance. He doesn't have to perform. He's found a way to guard the integrity of his message. He can say exactly what God has called him to say to the church. He can be radically truthful without being worried about them maybe like docking his pay a little bit. Right? And this is what he says. I have found this way. God has blessed this way. And I'm, in, I'm doing it this way. Why? So that more can come to believe in Jesus the Christ. So I want you to declare right now. I am not for sale. And that's what Paul says. He says, I am free. I am free. And financial integrity is a real big deal within the kingdom. And this is one of the things I think that the Lord is saying to us tonight. In 2021, it is imperative that we get free of every cruel master. How many um, Dave Ramsey students do we have here tonight? Financial Peace University. Listen, the number one reason why young couples get divorced is because of finances. It's so important that we understand and value and honor God's way of doing finances. And when it comes to our mission at Seattle Revival Center, it is this. To awaken people to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. What do you think is that thing that can um, compromise your identity, who you really are? What's that thing that can really compromise us quick? Finances. What's something that can compromise our destiny, our destination, where we're going? Finances. In fact, some people, they, they will go wherever the finances are. You know, some people, they'll move all across the country, here, there, and everywhere. Not because they prayed and obeyed, but because of finances. Let me just tell you guys. That I believe, this is, this is my own personal belief, and I wouldn't want to put my beliefs on you, but seek first the king, his kingdom, his righteousness, and all that other stuff will be added unto you. Listen, don't seek first finances. Don't seek first that killer job. Okay? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these. And what does that mean? The kingdom comes first. Yeah. Now I'll tell you, we are not going to see the kind of sustained, lasting awakening in Seattle until we have, as a company of people, uh, can truthfully say that we have put the kingdom of God before our careers. And that means that when it comes time to compromise and do different things, we don't say, I'll go where the money goes. We say, I'll go where God sends me. Because what are you going to do if God sends you somewhere and there's no, no opportunities for work? Are you going to disobey the Lord? And then what if you go somewhere where there's opportunity for work, but there's no kingdom opportunity there? Why? Because God didn't call you there. Listen, Microsoft is not your apostolic hub. If you're part of Seattle Revival Center, Seattle Revival Center is your apostolic hub. You're sent from here and you go to your next place where you have your kingdom assignment. Don't seek first the greatest paycheck. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. 
you know, for that, I love that we have a six o'clock service now because it's a third option. Some people have to work during the day. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, figure out a way to get to a house of worship once a week and to worship in person with real human beings in real gatherings. Do like you're doing it tonight. You're like, how do I do that? Just do what you're doing tonight. Listen, it doesn't have to be here. Okay, you pray, you obey, you let the Lord lead you, but do not neglect the gathering of the assembly because where we are going and where the culture is going, I don't know if anybody here, if your faith is strong enough to survive in the atmospheres where our country is going, you are going to need a faith-filled apostolic, prophetic, non-compromising community of people that will hold you accountable, accountable that will be, uh, that will come around you as a family. So this is our year to get free of every cruel master. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Here's what that means. That means that visa makes for a cruel master. Absolutely. If you're just in all kinds of debt, I got good news for you. You're in a house where people have paid off hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt in this place. Uh, and, 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 and I don't want to embarrass and I don't want to be like, who, who's, out who, who's not? It's not, it's not about that. It's not, but, but this is what I can tell you. We have testimonies here that are stinking contagious. And if you need some faith, to get out of debt, you come and find any of our, of our pastors, our leadership team, we will introduce you to ordinary people with ordinary jobs who had extraordinary debt and now they are debt free because of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's the thing. You're like, who cares about financial freedom? You know, we should be talking about getting free of demons. You know, I'll tell you this. Credit card debt is a demon. I'll tell you this, those little devils that are calling you once a week, well, hey, you said you're going to send off your five dollars and you so when are you going to send off that I, I'm telling you I'm telling you right now, you do not have to live under that harassment. Don't make that kind of harassment, don't make that kind of life your normal life. He didn't create you to be harassed by by uh, debt collectors. He created you to be free of every cruel master. This is your year. Listen, you might not get completely free of credit card debt this year, but you might. And this is what I know, even if you're not completely free, you're going to get a good start at it. But you got to make up your mind. You got to say, I'm going to get free of every cruel master. Why? Because I only need one shepherd. <laughs> For the Lord is my shepherd. And he's not out to harass me. He's out to provide for me and care for me. And there's a community here. We'll come around you. We'll get you into Financial Peace University. We'll get some stuff. We'll get some stuff figured out. In fact, I had a, I had a man come to me. This is amazing. He came to me in this morning service. He said, Pastor Darren, man, that word was so right on. I was like, awesome. Thanks so much, brother. He's like, no, you don't understand. The Lord spoke to me about debt this week. I said, Awesome. Praise the Lord. He goes, no, you don't understand. On Friday, I paid off over $100,000 of debt. I'm completely debt-free from all credit card debt. <laughs> Guess what? The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. I speak that out. Your atmosphere changes because if he did that this week, you can do something significant next week. And every time you send off your payment and, every, and you call them up and like, I'm serious. If you're over your head, if you're being harassed, you come talk to the shepherds here. We're going to stick up for you. We're going to get you some financial counseling. Yep, yep, because you don't have to be harassed. And there's amazing tools. There's some amazing things. But this is your year to get free of every cruel master. And not just Visa. I'm not just picking on them. You know, we're talking about what about cruel employers? If you have a boss that's requiring you to do something that's unethical. We're talking about what about cruel even ministers or ministries, maybe somebody that you're sewing into, but there's financial manipulation. And let me just say this right now. If, if you have given a tremendous, let's just say, a, 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 like might I say, an irresponsible amount of money in the church and you regret it because you felt like you were financially manipulated by a minister to give something that you didn't even have. And if that is you as a minister, 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I repent to you tonight. If you went into great debt in order to give uh, to, to, to the church, you were given unwise counsel from somebody that claimed to be uh, uh, representing Jesus, I want to repent tonight. And I would ask you that you would forgive me. Listen, beloved, we never give because we're manipulated by a minister. We don't even give because of what we hear being said from a pulpit. Why do we give? Because we heard from the Lord. Because we heard from Jesus. And I'll tell you, if you say, Pastor Darren, Jesus told me to go into all this debt, all this credit card debt so I can give this ministry. I'll tell you right now, no, he didn't. He didn't. Because Jesus is not going to say, I want you to trade out me as your Lord so that you can go underneath the lordship of a cruel master called American Express. So I'm sorry, you didn't hear from God. And that's okay. There's been times that I haven't heard from God and I thought that I did. So if you've been financially manipulated by ministers and ministries, would you forgive me? Just say yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Because I'm telling you, there's something about releasing yourself of all judgment. And the Lord can free up your currency. How many know that your money has a current? That's why they call it currency. And it affects us emotionally. How many know that tomorrow the markets are going to open? And there's going to be ups and downs. And how many know that the economy of our country is linked to the stock market? And that even subconsciously that people whose souls are intertwined with that system, they're going to fill up. They're going to fill down. They're not even going to necessarily know why. Why? The currency of that economy is dictating to them and their disposition how they should feel without them even knowing why they feel that way. Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, we are to operate according to a contrasting economy, the economy of the kingdom of heaven. So that when the earth is groaning and travailing about the lack of need, we can say, we heard from God. We have stored up. We have lived responsibly. How can we help you? I am telling you, there is a Joseph anointing that's coming on the church where we live with such revelation that we're not reacting to the economy of our country. Why? We've heard from the Lord and we are ready to bless the city with our wealth. I'll tell you this, Solomon understood it. He said, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Why is that? It's because you have the righteous. The Sadek is where the word Melchizedek comes from. You have a company of kings. In, you guys doing okay? Yeah. I, I can do this all night. You know, I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. I just look. Because you have a company of kings and priests that are attached to a heavenly economy, and to a different currency. And we hear from the Lord and we prepare differently. We're, we're weird. Yeah, that we heard from the Lord, we got free of every cruel master so that when people are jumping out of windows and freaking out, we can say, we were born for such time as this. Wouldn't it be awesome if Seattle Revival Center got so stinking blessed that the city of Seattle said, well, we don't exactly believe in what you guys believe in, but thank you. And if we're going to do that, then we're got, we have to get free of every cruel master and see that Jesus is the shepherd of our finances. All right, this is what Paul says. I value the gospel. I value the kingdom. And because of this, it is imperative that the body of Christ, that we value integrity in every endeavor. Why? Because... Listen, like, if you've ever been in this place, I don't know if you've ever been in this place where you're kind of freaking out finances or freaking out about your job and freaking out about what, whatever, and, and, like, and, and you want to, like, keep up with the Joneses, and they got the new Tesla, and they, they, they got the new house, and new all this stuff, and, like, and, and, and there's something about that American consumerism where we always want, like, new, 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 new. And so sometimes in fantasy land within our heads, we begin to construct the ideal us in the future, and we construct this future us, we reverse engineer back to the present, and then we begin doing whatever it takes now in order to get to where we want to be. And so if that means that uh, uh, compromising our integrity, our ethics, and our morals, it, if that means that we, we have to tell ourselves, gosh, this isn't who I am. Like, this isn't who I am, but this is what I'm going to have to do right now, because I know where I want to be. 
I know who I want to be, and therefore, I need to compromise in this area. This sucks. Uh, and this is what I know. Guys, in the kingdom of God, integrity radically matters. Why? Because we're not building a futuristic American dream. No, 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 no. We are part of this mission of Jesus to see his kingdom come and his will be done. That means everything that we're doing, it's about the temple. That means that your body, it's a temple. Your marriage is a temple. Your home is a temple. Your, 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 with your children, with your atmospheres, it, it's, a, it's a temple. I mean, in temple life, atmosphere was important. There was protocol to protect. At your job, it's, it's a temple. That, you're, that believers don't work for a paycheck. No, no. For the believer, for the son and the daughter in God, um, our work is our worship unto the Lord. Yeah, our work is our worship. So our, our, when we're at work, that's just as much worship than what we were doing here um, tonight. And so we say, I am a temple. I'm the new box. I am the ark of the covenant. And the Holy Spirit is inside of me. And with my wife, there's two forming an ark. And the Spirit of God is within us that Andrew and I, we are in unity. So if we come into agreement on anything, it shall be established. I don't know if you heard that. If Andrew and I come into agreement on anything, it is established. It, it, bro, I can prove that story after story after story. That's why Jesus said, if there's two or more in agreement, there I will be in the midst. Why? Because it takes two in that place of community to form an ark where the Spirit of God can come. It takes two for there to be life. It takes a male and a female for there to be in the place of covenant union. The spark of God, the, the Word of God, the, the seed of God, the consciousness of God, the breath of God comes into the womb and the father begins knitting together and even the, the genetic materials of the mother and the father come around the spirit that was sent from the voice of God. The spirits from God, the genetics of the DNA of the parents wrap around the God dream, the God scene, the God thing and it begins to, just to go at work and, and people say it's just a fetus. It ain't a fetus. It's a master stinking piece. It's a masterpiece and there's God and he's knitting and he's weaving and he's, and he's creating Creating something beautiful. If the church isn't willing to fight for that masterpiece, then we are as lost as lost. If we're not willing to fight for the handiwork of the Father, at work within young women that think that if they have this child, they'll be destined to poverty. The enemy is a liar. If we're not willing to fight for that, what are we willing to fight for? We're pathetic and lost. For a child with no voice, let us be a voice. For the young woman without any sort of affluence or any sort of wealth that's looking at poverty, may we come around that young woman to help her, to steward what the Lord is doing within her womb. Get free of every cruel master so that we don't compromise, so that we don't make unwise, un the people are making unwise choices every single day, not because they're bad people, but because they have no hope. That we've got a very serious issue in the church. It's called hope deferred, and it makes the heart sick. And I'm telling you, when you've got hope deferred, when your heart is sick, when you're afraid, when you're terrified, we will make unwise choices because we've been tricked into thinking there is a future waiting for us and the only way to get to that future is through compromise. Let me just tell you this. Don't make an idol out of your future. Don't make an idol out of Canaan. Don't make an idol out of the promised land. Why? Because I'll tell you what's better than the promised land, being with him in the desert. I'll tell you what's better than riches and wealth and fame, being with Jesus in the place of insignificance. That if I have him and in my integrity, then I have everything. But if I have everything and no integrity, then I am lost and I am hopeless. 
And this is what we read, that we would value him in every endeavor because he will not bless our compromise. And I know of religious, I know of Christian organizations that are not doing well. And the reason why they are not doing well is because God will not bless them because they have compromised. And they think they can make certain hiring choices. They think they can do certain kinds of things. And it's okay. And it's not okay. Why? Because they have a mission statement. And they're being inconsistent with their own mission statement. I am telling you, you need to know who you are. You need to know what God has called you to do. And it is not okay to compromise the present with the future in sight. Because the end does not justify the means. That our choices matter. Our decisions matter. I want you to declare right now. I'm not for sale. I'm going to get free of every cruel master because I'm not for sale. That means no one has permission to manipulate me. No one. No one has permission to control me. No, you don't get to use the scripture verse, wives submit to your husbands, to allow for your husband to financially manipulate you, emotionally manipulate you, sexually manipulate you. I'm not telling you to get a divorce. I'm telling you to cry out for help. I'm telling you to hit up our pastors, to hit up our elders. Why? We're not going to say, you need to get a divorce. What we're going to say is, let's sit down. Let's talk. Let's figure out what boundaries look like. Let's figure out what this conversation looks like. Why? Because people have used the Bible to enable abuse, and it's wrong, and they will give an account to the Lord. I'm even talking about pastors and ministers that have used the Bible to push forward their own agenda that promotes their own selfishness and their own greed. And it is a sin. And I'm telling you, if anyone's got control of your heart and they're manipulating, or if you are manipulating, controlling, or abusing someone else, tonight is your night to repent, to come before the Lord and to say, Father, I am sorry. I've had a wicked heart and I repent. This is not who I am. This is not who I want to be. I want to trust you tonight that I refuse to be somebody else's cruel master. I, I want you to declare that right now. I refuse to be somebody else's cruel master. I will not be a cruel master to my children, manipulating them, controlling them. I will not be a controlling, domineering master to my wife. I will not be this in, in, in my church. I will not lead this way. Hold me accountable. That we will partner with each other in brotherly love, outdoing one another, valuing integrity in every endeavor. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking. It's verses 19 and 24. You'll recognize this. And this is what Jesus says. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, but where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your, there your heart will follow. Now, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light in you is darkness, then how great will that darkness be? Man, Jesus, right? Now check it out. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, this word mammon, okay, this is a deity. This is a pagan god. And th this, this god would have a throne. People would actually present offerings to this demon god, this demon god of mammon. In fact, in paganism, they believed that it was mammon was synonymous with Satan himself. So another word for Satan would be mammon, which is basically, it's this place of a lust for more, the fear of lack, okay, and full-on unbridled selfishness. So they look at mammon as he was one that was in heaven, and he saw God, he saw God's stuff. He didn't want the Father he wanted the streets of gold. And in that place, Satan was thrown out of heaven. So, 
people in the first century, they would present sacrifices to these gods, to this god of mammon. Why? Because of fear, fear of lack. And if they could appease this evil, demonic god, nobody liked mammon, okay? Like, like no, they were afraid of mammon. That's why they would worship mammon, because they were afraid of him. And they wanted to be blessed. So they wanted to appease this god. But this name mammon in the English can be translated money. And here's what Jesus says. Son, daughter, you're going to have to pick a god. Because you're not going to be able to worship me and mammon at the same time. Why? We are radical opposites in every category. Mammon is selfish, never satisfied, always needs more, manipulates, controls in order to get more. Mammon's always hungry for more. Feed me. Feed me. But God, God's nothing like that. God is nothing like that. Why? Because everything that God created gives. Everything that God created, it doesn't take, it doesn't consume. He created the sun to give us light. He created the stars and the moon to govern the night. That everything that God created, including us, including his church, that we are created to give. Why? Because when we give, we can fully live. And when we consume, we slowly die. This is what Paul says. There's two realities. I can store up treasures here, or I can store up treasures there. And let's talk for a second. You see, the Gnostics, the heresy of this time when Paul writes this letter says, money is evil, that possessions are evil, that treasures are evil. And this is what Paul says, hey, I got my own little business, so I can take care of me. It's not evil. I'm stewarding my life in such a way. I can, it's not a sin to receive. It's not a sin to drink and to eat the fruit of your labor. Isn't this awesome? This is what the gospel does. It liberates you from the law. It brings you to this place where you get to pray and obey. See, Pastor Darren, how do I handle my finances? I don't know. You're going to need some counseling, you're going to need the Holy Spirit, and you're going to need to pray and obey. Religion will tell you, spend your money this way. The gospel will say, you're going to need a relationship with Jesus. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. And this is the freedom that we have, church. We get to, treasure, we get to steward treasures on the earth, receive from those treasures, and give thanks to the Lord for those treasures. But we also get to store up treasures in a realm that is not natural, it's supernatural, and it is not finite, it's infinite. Paul says, I could do this and take money, but instead I will do this storing up treasures in heaven. Therefore, I got something to confess. I have a hidden bank account. Hold on. I have an offshore bank account. Hold on. I have a tax-free bank account. Hold on. I have an out of this planet, out of the atmosphere, I have an intergalactic. <laughs> bank account. And not only is it eternal, you should see what the interest is on it. Why? Because he takes my natural and he adds his super to it. I have a supernatural bank account in the heavens. And I get to steward on the earth. Yeah. And give thanks to the Lord. I got, I got an old Dodge truck. Okay. I got an old Dodge truck. It's got like almost 300,000 miles on it. And guess what? Every time it starts, it's like a miracle. No, I'm serious. Imagine being like 120 years old and every day being like, okay, I'm alive. Thank you, Jesus. That's what it's like with my car. Not with my car, with my, with my truck. 
And every time he starts up, like, you can do it, Max. You can do it. You can do it. Yes, Max, you're alive. Max, you're alive. Breathe in the fresh air, Max. Max, you are killing the earth with your exhaust. He's just like, yeah, he's like, he's like the Methuselah of trucks. He's just like, <laughs> and when I get into Max, what do I do? I give thanks. Why? Max is my gift from God. Why? Because I had a desire for a charcoal gray, quad cab, Dodge Ram, and somebody I didn't even know just walked up and said, would you like this truck? And it was the same exact truck that I was shopping for. Max is a gift from God. Amen. Listen, Max isn't going to be in heaven. <laughs> There's going to come a time when Max is rusting away, bro. <laughs> no more Max. Dead as a doornail. He is a finite created thing that's temporary. And yet, it brings me an excuse to worship Jesus. A good friend of mine was given a multi-million dollar church, completely debt free, from a person he didn't even know. And when she gave this pastor the church, you want to know what she said? Well, I don't even know you. I have children in ministry, and I'm not giving it to them because the Lord told me to give it to you. Guys, imagine me giving multi-million. I'm talking a gorgeous church. And you want to know what she said? She goes, now I'll tell you. She's a real sweet old woman. I got to meet her. I got to pray with her. This is what she said. Now I'll tell you something, Pastor. If I were you, I would allow for the fear of the Lord to come upon you. This is what she said. She said, because brother, if you decided to go and have an affair or cheat on your wife or cheat on the finances, I wouldn't want to be you. <laughs> Guess what? Pastor has lunch with her every Sunday afternoon. They sit in the back room. They have lunch. She was obedient to the Lord for a multi-million dollar facility that she gifted over to a pastor that she had never met. You see, some of you have planted some pretty big seeds. And some of you, it's been a long time and you haven't seen the harvest yet. But I want to tell you tonight, God cares about the reward. Yes. And as a body, as a church, we need to not just care about the seed, we need to care about the harvest. I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about the, the tears that you have sown, the prayers that you have prayed, that place of radical faith where you took a ginormous risk. God cares about the reward. And can I tell you something? He cares about you because you are his reward. Vaughn, would you, would you come and do your... Now, 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 birthday boy here, what's up? Good to see you. I'm so stinking proud of you, Vaughn. You're so, you're the man, bro. I love you, dude. I love what you do on these keys up here, man. You, you make some crazy sounds, dude. Vaughn's a son in this house, and Vaughn had a period of his life where, where he left the house for a while and went and did his own thing. And then there was a day when Vaughn came home, S received, celebrated as a son by his own family, received and celebrated by us as a church. You say, Pastor Darren, why would you say that? Because the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Vaughn is a reward in this house. I don't know what you've lost. Maybe you've lost a son. Maybe you've lost a daughter. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you lost a friend. But I want to tell you about a father who so loved the world. 
but he also lost his son. He gave us. Now, I was sharing this little moment of repentance with the second service today. I mean, I was an AG kid, okay? Uh, third generation Assemblies of God, so I should know nothing about this. But there is a worldly, evil, demonic game called poker. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. It's called poker. It's so evil. Here's how it works. If the dealer gives you a really good hand, and you know that you have the best hand at the table, I know, I know this stuff here. I know things I shouldn't know. If you have the best hand at the table and you stink and know it, do you want to know what you do? You go all in. And let me tell you something. You knock them chips over is what you do. You take your big pile of chips and you just throw it down on the table. What does that mean? It means if you're wrong, it's your last hand. But if you're right, you just won the game. Guess what? The father looked down at the earth and saw the brokenness, the depravity, the wickedness of his creation that he created in his own image and likeness. And the father looked at the nations. The father looked at Seattle. The father looked at Capitol Hill. The father looked at what's happening in our nation, at the injustice. He looked at all of this. And you want to know what he said to the Son and to the Spirit? I got the best hand. I got the best hand. And you know what the Father did? With the Spirit, with the Son, he said, I'm going all in. I'm going all in. For God so loved the world that he sent the Son. For the Son so loved the Father that he obeyed the Father, surrendered, submitted, and came. For the Holy Spirit so loved the Father and the Son that he accompanied the Son and then occupied and possessed the sons of God for such a time as this. The Father so loved, he went all in. And I'm telling you, you are a reflection of the Father's best hand. Here's why you can say, I'm not for sale. The reason why you can say, I'm not for sale is because the devil can't stink and afford you. The devil can't afford you. You can say, I'm not going to compromise. Why? Because devil, you can't afford me. You can't afford me. Why? I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. He lived for me, he died for me, he resurrected for me, he ascended for me, he's seated at the right hand of the Father where he does what? He prays for me. Listen, you don't have to live in fear of debt. You don't have to live in fear of any cruel master. Why? Because your shepherd's here to rescue you tonight. Can we stand together? Isn't the gospel good news? Isn't the gospel so good news? The devil says, you're a failure. You should be embarrassed of yourself. And you say, no, no, I'm part of his perfect hand. He went all in for me. So there's something that God knows that you don't. I am valuable. I'm worth fighting for. I'm worth dying for. Tonight, God does not want your money. He doesn't need your money. He's in love with you. He wants your heart. I have a question for you tonight. It's a very important question. If something were to happen to you, if you were to die tonight, do you know for sure that you'd go to be with your Father for all of eternity? Some of you would say, Pastor Darren, of course, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a good man. And this is what I would tell you. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And we all need forgiveness. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. The Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hey, and you're a whosoever, so am I. So if you believe in your heart and you call out to Jesus, Jesus, will you be the Lord of my life? He'll step into your reality and he'll save you. 
This is what I, I'd like to do. I'd like to bless you tonight. Will you just hold out your hands just in like a receiving posture? Just go ahead and just relax. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to prove nothing. Just relax. And I'm just going to pray that Jesus would come right now. Jesus, would you walk into the room? Would you come here? Right now? Would you step up close and near to us right now, face to face? We thank you, Jesus, that in your kingdom, there's righteousness, peace, joy that in your presence there's no brokenness in your presence there's no fear in your presence there's no chaos Jesus we acknowledge your presence right here right now we acknowledge that heavenly and glorious atmosphere that is in this room We acknowledge the kind of atmosphere that is unexplainable except to say, I think we are in the presence of Jesus and His holiness. So right now, I speak to every imposter shepherd, every counterfeit Jesus, every counterfeit Savior. Shoot. I speak to every demon that has come up to rob you of your joy and your peace, and your identity. And I say to that spirit of fear, move aside right now in Jesus' name. Amen. To that spirit of abandonment, I declare this son and this daughter was bled for and died for. Shut your face, move aside right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. I speak to the spirit of shame, and I declare, by His stripes, we are redeemed, we are restored, and we are forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, that's as far. He has removed all of our transgressions from us. Shame, go right now in Jesus' name. Out, out right now. Up and out, up and out, up and out, up and out. Condemnation. Condemnation, listen up. You're not of God. You aren't conviction. You're a liar. You're a prosecuting attorney coming before the Father, trying to prosecute us for our record of wrongs. We say, condemnation, you are not of the Lord. Go right now, up and out, up and out, right now, up and out, up and out, up and out, right now, right now, right now, right now. And we declare revelation right now. We declare peace. We declare the love of Christ. Declare that realm of rest to come in right now to settle down upon you. I'm telling you, some of you are going to sleep better tonight than you slept in months. I see sleep insomnia being broken off of people right now. Insomnia being broken right now. I see eating disorders being broken off right now because of the spirit attached to it. it uh, honey, it's not, even, it's not even you, it's a spirit. And I speak to that spirit right now of eating disorders. I say, you're done. Go right now, out right now, up and out right now, up and out right now. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. You feel that? That's Jesus. If you're online, you can receive from the same Spirit right now. The same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. If you're watching online right now, just close your eyes. Take out your hands. Hold them in front of you. Just say, Jesus.
that peace, that love, that's, that joy, that is Jesus. He loves you so much. Now I'd like for you to bow your head. I'd like for you to close your eyes, no looking around. If you're here tonight, you say, Pastor Darren, I've had a lot of other cruel masters. But tonight, I want to trade out all my masters for the one true, kind shepherd. I want Jesus to be my only shepherd. Without anyone looking around, would you just wave your hand and wave it at me so I can see your hand right now? Awesome. God bless you. Just awesome. God bless you. Just wave at me. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome. 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 You say, Pastor Darren, I don't want religion as a cruel master. I'm going to trade out my cruel masters for the joy of the Lord tonight. If that's you, just wave at me. Wave at me. Wave at me. You say, I've been for sale, but I, awesome. God bless you. God bless you. But tonight you say, Pastor Darren, I am done. I am not for sale. God bless you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's all pray together, okay? Jesus, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are a good shepherd, that you died for all my sins, that you resurrected from the grave, that you have ascended and you are seated at the right hand of the Father where you're making intercession for me. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, and I give you permission tonight to come and to rescue me from every harassing spirit, from every harassing master. Jesus, deliver me tonight. I receive by faith my deliverance in Jesus' name. Listen to a shout of praise to the Lord tonight. Jesus! <laughs> As a priest of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare over you tonight, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. I want to welcome you to the family of Jesus Christ. Listen, when you mess up, I said when you mess up, don't run from Jesus, run to Him. His arms will always be open wide. You're not saved because of what you have done, you're saved because of what He has done. Listen now, this morning at their second service, I was standing by the door, two young women were waiting to chat. And one of the girls said to me, Pastor Darren, we've been waiting. I said, awesome. What's up? She goes, I want to introduce you to my friend. Today was her first day here at SRC. And today, she made Jesus Christ the Lord of her life. And you know what I told her? I said, welcome to the family of God. You are a daughter you have permission to bug me, to harass me. You're never a burden. Listen, if you gave your life to Jesus tonight, would you do me a big favor? Would you tell your friends? Would you tell your family? Would you promise that you're not going to be ashamed of Him? And neither was He ashamed of you? Can you tell me that you'll come up and talk to our team? And if you haven't been water baptized yet, we'll get it set up to get you water baptized. Can I declare of you tonight? You are a new creation reality. And you just look out, because God is going to radically transform you without you even trying. I want to tell you something. You're gorgeous, 
You're absolutely loved. God is so proud of you, and I am too. No more condemnation. Why? There is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Hey church, this is the latest events and happenings at SRC. It's all hands on deck this Saturday for a big spring cleaning day here at SRC. Uh, we would love it if you could come help us. You can scan the code on your bulletin. If you don't got a bulletin, you can go to our website and just fill out our form very quickly to let us know that you're coming. And there will also be box lunches provided. We have a young adults potluck a week from today. So if you're a young adult or a young adult couple, join us downstairs in the fellowship hall for a time of fellowship and food. That's gonna be at four o'clock. So just right before the 6 p.m. service. Yep, and there's a lot of other things that are happening at SRC. So be sure to check out our website under our events page to stay up to date with the latest happenings at SRC.